Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome to WBEZ's post-election analysis. I'm Steve Edwards, Chief Content Officer at WBEZ, and we are pleased to have you with us tonight for an important and timely conversation. I want to welcome everybody joining us across platforms, including on Facebook and YouTube. And I also want to remind you that we will be taking your comments and your questions throughout the conversation. In fact, rather than doing 45 minutes or 50 minutes of uh, me asking the questions and talking with NPR's national political correspondent, Mara Eliasson, uh, we're going to break tonight up into sections so that you have the opportunity to ask questions about our big topics tonight. And our big topics tonight include the presidential transition and what's happening right now. We'll also talk further about what's going on in Washington and on Capitol Hill as it relates to the balance of power. Uh, we'll also look at the state legislative picture in that. And then we'll pull the lens out more broadly to look at exit polls, voting returns over the course of the last couple of weeks as we've come to understand them and what it says about our parties, what it says about the candidates, Trump and Biden at the national level, and most importantly, what it says about where we are as a country and where we are headed as a political culture. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce NPR's national political correspondent, Mara Eliasson, who's a familiar voice to so many of us. Mara, it's great to have you. Welcome, and thank you so much for carving out time in what is an extraordinarily busy time for you. Well, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, why don't we dive in and talk about the transition? We're talking exactly two weeks after election night, and we still don't have a formal concession from the president. We still have the president and his supporters um, waging legal fights, um, and we don't have the machinery of a presidential transition that normally would be underway at a time like this in progress. Um, so that's led a lot of people to wonder what's going on with the president. Yeah. Some have said, are we witnessing a coup in progress right now? Are we witnessing um, Trump playing gamesmanship as it relates to the media and others? Or is this a Trump grieving process? How would you characterize what we're witnessing? Well, the. The first thing that I always try to spend absolutely no time doing is what's in Donald Trump's head. If he's going through a grieving process, I don't know. Look, losing is a hard thing for any super competitive politician. Anyone who becomes president of the United States doesn't like to lose. For Donald Trump, it's so much more than that. First of all, uh, his brand is about never, ever losing. He monetizes his brand. So if he wants to continue to monetize it, the Trump brand after he's out of office, which he will be, I am convinced of that. Um, he needs to convince or at least keep this false narrative going that he was, the election was stolen from him, it was rigged, he was really the winner. Um, so he needs to keep that going for business reasons, for political reasons. He wants to <clears throat> maintain his iron grip on the base of the Republican Party. So if especially if he's going to run again, which he has talked about doing. So he needs to have a lot of people invested in this narrative that uh, Joe Biden is an illegitimate president, literally illegitimate, not just unpopular. This is different than 2016. A lot of Republicans say, oh, it's similar. Hillary Clinton conceded. The legal challenges were mostly from Jill Stein. No one said Donald Trump didn't win the election fair and square. Uh, that's quite different than today. So if Donald Trump wants to sell a lot of merch and have people stay in his hotels, he needs to, to push this narrative. And if he wants to keep a firm grip on the party, uh, he wants to. Now, it comes at a great cost uh, because you now have large numbers of Republicans believing the election wasn't fair. Joe Biden is an illegitimate president. This has never happened before in American history. Of all the norms that the president has obliterated, this to me might be the worst one. Uh, and the one with the most serious effects. I've basically been saying for four years that Donald Trump is a stress test on democratic institutions. And when you go down the checklist of them, some of them came through with flying colors. I mean, we still have an independent judiciary who has rejected most all of the Trump arguments about the election being fraudulent. We have a citizenry who turned out in historic numbers in a pandemic to vote in a whole variety of ways. Uh, that was really, really heartening. 
the election went off smoothly. There wasn't violence. There doesn't seem to be foreign inter successful foreign interference. That's all great. Um, I think the free press, the mainstream media is still doing its job. Uh, the Republic, the, the political parties, another question, another matter altogether. Uh, but so, so that's, you know, that's why Donald Trump is doing what he's doing. Uh, I don't think he thinks he can stay in office, but he's got to create, he's got to go out of office with the final and biggest conspiracy theory, which is that he's the rightful president. As far as it affects the actual transition on a day-to-day -day basis, you heard Joe Biden today kind of ratchet up the pressure saying, look, if this goes on and we are denied access to the resources and the uh, uh uh, administration personnel, the government sources that we need to plan our, our administration, people are going to die. I mean, he was about as blunt as you could get. So it has practical effects uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but there is a um, timeline to this. Soon the election will be certified, the Electoral College will meet. I mean, this is a grinding process, and at some point, uh, you know, Joe Biden is going to be the president. Yes, he's, he's wasting valuable time. The one Thing I'd say that is um, that mitigates some of that is Joe Biden has already spent eight years in the White House, and he has a team of people who, I mean, if Donald Trump told us over and over again, sneeringly, that Joe Biden had 47 years of experience in Washington as an insult, the fact is that the combined experience of the people around Joe Biden is probably like hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands. So they know how to govern. They know how to staff these agencies. I would say, I was, we had a call this morning with our White House team and I said, look, buckle your seatbelts, get ready for a ton of governing because these people know what they're doing. Now, they might not be successful, but they know what to do. They know how to staff up these agencies, which were hollowed out during the Trump administration. I said this morning in my piece, Donald Trump thought that the government bureaucracy, the, the, the civil servants, what professional civil servants were, was the swamp, the deep state full of enemies. Joe Biden looks at the government as a tool to help ordinary people, especially in a time of crisis, as in right now with the pandemic. So I think when they are allowed to get going, which should be soon, they will hit the ground running. Uh, the uh, Biden wanna, team will hit the ground running. Uh, well, I want to play a clip from conservative Republican and former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton speaking to the transition challenges on Sunday on ABC's This Week. Let's take a listen. He will make uh, life as difficult as he can for the incoming Biden administration. I think that harms the country. I've been through five separate transitions and I know how difficult it is coming in and going out. And every day that he delays under the pretense that he's simply asking for his legal remedies uh, ultimately is to the country's disadvantage. So that's John Bolton. Why have we not heard from more Republicans urging the Trump administration to begin the process of a transition and for Trump himself to concede? You're not hearing it because they are still afraid of Trump, not him personally, but the grip that he has on the Republican base. I think that the most abject example of this was Jim Lankford of Oklahoma, Senator, who said very bravely the other day that he was going to insist that Biden get intelligence briefings uh, if they didn't happen soon. And then a couple of days later, he said, oh, I was misinterpreted. I really didn't mean, I, I can't remember the exact phrase he used. I think he said I, he was going to step in or something. Oh, no, I didn't mean I was going to step in. I really didn't mean that. So, so clearly he got a tremendous amount of, I mean, Oklahoma is ground zero for Trump country. So he clearly got a lot of pushback. So I would say Republicans are not profiles in courage. Um, there's there's also a short-term um, dynamic happening, which is on January 5th, there's a, two special elections in Georgia, which for all practical purposes is one special election. The two candidates now are running together. This is the final uh, battle of the 2020 election. And uh, Republicans are afraid that Donald Trump might get angry and do something to undermine their chances in that election. So they don't want to tick him off. Um, you know, David Axelrod said something to me that didn't go on the air. So this is this is uh, exclusive to BEZ. He said, <laughs> you know, most Republicans are like, how can I miss you when when you when you won't you know when you won't leave? What's this the country music song? You know, how can I miss you when you won't go away? I think in private, a lot of Republicans feel that way, but in public, they just can't uh, because. And this is harsh, but you know, critics of Trump say, and, and these are the never Trump Republicans 
and anti-Trump Republicans say the party has become a, become a cult of personality, you know, that it's it's all about him. The fact that the Republican Party did not have a platform at the convention, all they, they issued just a statement of support for, for President Trump. So what does the Republican Party stand for? Right now, pretty much whatever Donald Trump wants at a given moment. That maybe will change over time, but for Republicans who are really eager to begin the debate about what does a post-Trump Republican Party look like, they can't because there is no post-Trump Republican Party. He's There's no post-Trump Trump. He's going to be the most important factor in the Republican Party, I think, for as long as he's alive. Um, I, I and that, you know, that's just a fact. Uh, so much more to pick up on there. Let me just pause really quickly and say to all of you who are with us, um, if you have a question or a comment about uh, anything related to the presidential transition process we've been talking about, go ahead and type it in your chat. Uh, give us your name. Tell us um, what uh, what community you're in. And uh, I'd love to share those with Mara. This is an opportunity for you to pretend to be Rachel Martin, Steve Inske, <laughs> or uh, uh, Elsa Chang or anybody else. Um, so, so much to pick up on there, but let me, we skipped over something that I just want to bore in on for a second. Um, and that has to do with these legal challenges. And I know that you are not uh, a legal reporter, but are you saying that, that um, like others, that there is, there's really no way at this point Correct. that these challenges Correct. or any of the other steps in the process, the electors voting on December yeah. 14th, the House and Senate, yeah. in, that that's that's all yes that's done yes it's it's done but the fact that as long as he's out there in court on twitter pushing this narrative that he really won and convincing more and more republicans that the election was unfair that is huge it do, it's not going to have an effect on whether joe biden becomes president or not but the fact that i think there was a morning consult poll that right after on election day or the day after 35 percent of republicans thought the election was rigged now it's like 75 percent of republicans i mean that is terrible for democracy the most the most important norm of democracy is a peaceful transfer of power and that people accept when they lose um, that's just distinguishes democracy from every other system of government. And he's undermining that. So in terms of Donald Trump being a stress test on democratic institutions, as he leaves office in these, these, you know, the next month or two is doing, I think, more damage to our democratic institutions than he did in all four years that he was in, in office. So what, what does that mean then, Mara, for Joe Biden's presidency and his ability to, as yeah. he has said time and again, yeah. to want to unite the country and right. most importantly, legislate in a way that right. can provide meaningful responses to the challenges before us? Well, those are two separate things. He can do a lot of things to try to unite the country on his own. He cannot legislate without Mitch McConnell. I mean, those are two separate things. So uniting the country, being the president, as he says over and over again, I'm going to be the president for people who didn't vote for me, as well as the people who did vote for me. Donald Trump was fixated on his base and nothing else. But Joe Biden is going to have to prove that he meant it. There are lots of ways he can do it. He can go to red states. He can go into people's homes who voted for Trump and talk about his initiatives, why lowering the, the Medicare age to 60 makes sense for them. Um, but legislating, if... If Republicans win even one of the seats in Georgia, although I think both of them will probably go in the same direction, um, Mitch McConnell will have tremendous leverage. He'll decide. Mitch McConnell's decision about what is in his own political interests, I said this this morning, whether it's gridlock or compromise, that's going to determine the fate of a lot of Joe Biden's legislative agenda. That does not mean that Joe Biden can't be a successful president, can't show every single day that he is the president that people wanted. He's going to be an empathetic, competent leader in the first couple of months when his number one, two, and three job is to get COVID under control. That will obviously have something to do with legislation. He wants a big relief act. The Republicans don't. But there's lots of stuff he can do on a daily basis to model a different kind of president. We don't know what it's going to be like for people. You know, every president is like uh, is a reaction to the one before. You know, you didn't like that cerebral Obama. Okay, let's take Donald Trump. He's different. <laughs> I, I, I think we, we went overboard there. Um, you didn't like chaos Trump. You know, it was all about him. Every day was a crisis. Well, now you're going to get Joe Biden, who's going to be 
normal, you know, whatever that means now. So we don't know what, the, what, what that will do to the temperature. I think we can talk about what the message of the voters was, very confusing. They sent two very conflicting messages, but one thing I think we can be clear on, they want Joe Biden to lower the temperature and they want him to act like he is the president for all Americans. And he's gonna get a chance to do that, Mitch McConnell notwithstanding. Yeah, there's more I wanna talk about in terms of the Biden-McConnell relationship, but let me get to a few questions pouring in. Uh, Terry, first up, wants to know what can be done to pressure Trump and his administration um, and by extension um, leading congressional Republicans to put the wheels in motion to start the transition? What, what if anything, could be done there? I mean, Biden is trying to do it. Uh, you've got people, he met with labor and business leaders. You've got people from all sorts of parts of American life saying, let's move forward. Privately, you know, I said Republicans would like to say, how can I miss you if you won't go away? What they really want to say to Donald Trump is, please don't let the screen door hit you on the way out, but they can't do that. I just don't see as long as we are so divided, and that was one of the big messages of this election, you know, the people decided we are divided. As long as you've got half the country, uh, you know, with Donald Trump, there's very little incentive for him to step aside gracefully and graciously. That's the ultimate presidential norm, to give the guy who comes after you some clear space. Every other president has done it. Uh, even ones that were defeated after one term. So I don't know what you can do to quote, pressure the Republicans. I think things are just gonna happen. You know, the machinery will move forward and Joe Biden is gonna be the president. Will he have lost precious time? Probably, but he's not hobbled in the way that someone who's a total newcomer to Washington would be. That's what I was trying to say. The guy knows a lot about, you know, how the government works. He's gonna use the government in a way that Donald Trump either didn't want to or was incapable of. Um, quick question, then I want to get to another. I mean, is it fair to say that under the analysis you were talking about, that um, with Georgia being such an important high stakes set of special elections on January 5th, that we won't see really more calls, at least from top Senate Republicans. Not till after Georgia. Until after Georgia. Yeah. So Absolutely. maybe on January yes. 6th. Yes. We start that, yes. There's no doubt that a lot of this, I said, there's, there's like this short term thing, get through Georgia, and then who knows what happens after that because we have to see what georgia does i mean the two competing headlines in this which is so wild every election is unique and different but it's kind of like for the democrats who just won an incredibly decisive victory i mean joe biden's margin is going to be bigger than ronald reagan's it's going to be it's already 50.8 and it'll probably be more he's winning by like four point four and a half points in america we call that a landslide okay so the headlines for the Democrats is Joe Biden wins decisive victory. Terrible day for Democrats. For the Republicans, it's like, you know, Donald Trump loses, Republicans triumphant and emboldened. So it's like, who knew winning could be so depressing for the Democrats and who knew losing could be so great for the Republicans? You know, the House Republicans right now are so emboldened. They are absolutely convinced they're getting the majority back in 2022. It's really something. Uh, so the only right now the, the voters kind of punished both parties. They said, look, the only way out of this horrible box is that you have to work together. And that's something that there are tremendous, you know, centripetal or centrifugal forces, the ones that push you away from each other in American life. And it's hard to see, even with Joe Biden in the White House, how those forces get overcome. But the, the, the public does want both sides to work together. There's no doubt about that. Let, since you were talking about um, the congressional Republicans, let's put up a slide that shows the current balance of power. We should point out there's still a handful of races that have yet to be decided, but you can see there that the balance of power in the House still favors uh, the Democrats, the balance of power in the Senate, pending the outcome of the Georgia special runoff. So that's the state legislature slide, I think. I'm, no? I'm sorry, yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, uh, but that's still something worth talking about because that was the yeah, Democrats' yeah. biggest failure. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, can we go to the congressional side though, really quickly? Can we go back to that slide? Um, the congressional there you go. Split. All right. So you can see what I was just talking about yeah. there, just the, the split. Um, and you know, the as as 
you know, Joe Biden has talked about and people have touted his ability to work across the aisle to um, yeah. build relationships. But what you just said a second ago um, really suggests that we're going to see a repeat of what yeah. we saw in 2008 to 2010 with the Obama administration. The, is, is everything Joe Biden wants to do legislatively essentially dead on arrival? Well, that is the easiest, most, um, that's the easiest analysis. Now, we don't know. Maybe, assuming the Republicans win. Yeah, assuming they win Georgia. Georgia. Look, you know, Ben Sass, Mitt Romney, Lisa Murkowski, and Susan Collins could become this like centrist Republican bloc who's willing to work across the aisle. We don't know. Um, but look, Joe Biden has, a, there are many, many reasons why Joe Biden is the perfect president for this totally hamstrung, equally divided country. First of all, he's a moderate Democrat. He's a half a loaf kind of guy. He knows how to negotiate without making the other guy feel that feel that he's uh, contemptuous of him. He knows how to build coalitions. He is willing to take, uh, you know, a bipartisan compromise over, over everything he wants. So yes, he has had a relationship with Mitch McConnell, but Mitch McConnell is not going to do something because he likes Joe Biden. He's gonna do something because he sees it in his political interest. Now with Obama, he decided his political interest, as he said, was doing everything he could to make Obama a one-term president. You know, he was very open about that. Uh, there will be no judges confirmed, I can tell you that. There might be a few in Illinois, a few district court judges in Illinois, but, but Mitch McConnell isn't gonna confirm any of Joe Biden's judges. So we're now seeing kind of the, it's weird, we're now seeing kind of the ultimate conclusion of hyperpolarization and partisanship. It's, it looks terrible and dystopian. On the other hand, you've got a guy in the White House who campaigned on trying to at least mitigate some of this. And as he says over and over again, Biden, not cooperating is a choice. If we choose not to cooperate, we can also choose to cooperate. So there are actually things, and I can tell you what they are, where both sides could compromise. Yeah, they I'm going to compromise on that. infrastructure. Everyone but wants Dana infrastructure. Dana asked a question about that, yeah. you know, and about yeah. McConnell's willingness to compromise yeah. in other areas. So continue. Yeah. yeah. So, so McConnell has two goals. One, he's already achieved. Con uh, cement a conservative majority on the courts for generations. Okay, he got that. Second one is make sure he gets the major he keeps his majority and grow it in 2022. Now he's got a lot of Republicans up in 2022 and it's gonna be tough. Maybe he sees it in their interest um, that some of them should be able to go home with an infrastructure bill or, so, or, or uh, I don't think he would wanna raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, but let's remember what happened in Florida. Florida gave Donald Trump a decisive three point win. At the same time, they were passing by 62% a referendum to raise the Florida's minimum wage to $15 an hour. I mean, so there are some progressive economic policies that are popular. I don't think that you're gonna get the Medicare age lowered to 60. You're not gonna get a public option on Obamacare. I don't, I, maybe, maybe you could get some kind of dreamers plus guest workers immigration um, compromise, maybe infrastructure. There are little things you could do around um, around uh, uh, jobs, education, broadband. There are things you can do, but it's going to be, it's not going to be the big transformative things that Democrats wanted. Here's the, here's the irony. You know, you had Elizabeth Warren in the primary saying bold structural change, big structural change. That's what we need. That was not only rejected by Democrats resoundingly in the primary, it also was rejected um, in the general election, you know, so there's going to be, it's going to be really, really hard. What Democrats were hoping and the reason why Democrats were so disappointed, and this was what was so funny. I mean, they got, they defeated Donald Trump in a historic victory. They flipped five states, but they were still depressed because what they wanted was a realignment. And realignments are very healthy for American politics because we're not just, um, 50 50, you know, at, at loggerheads, but we didn't get one. There's been a slow motion realignment for a while in America, which is what do they say? Density and diplomas, urban metro areas with lots of college educated people. They are blue. They're blue wherever you live, even in a red state. So there is a slow motion realignment happening, but it hasn't happened enough and below the presidential level uh, to really make a difference. So we're stuck. We're stuck in this 
you know, hyperpolarized space, and now they're going to have to make the best of it. But yes, there are things that that could get passed, and Joe Biden is the guy who would be willing to pass them, as opposed to just, you know, saying if I don't get everything I want, you know, I'll take it to the voters. Um, we're still getting questions on the presidential transition, and I don't want to lose those. We'll pick okay. those back up at the end if there's time. But I want to follow up on your comment, Mara just about big structural change and what Senator Elizabeth Warren was running on during the primaries. Tom asks, how does uh, a President Biden deal with the divided Democratic House between moderates yeah. and progressives? What do you expect there? Well, this is really interesting because if they had won control of the Senate, there would have been tremendous pressure on him from the left to um, you know, push the Green New Deal or big big proposals for health care, et cetera. Without control of the Senate, we have to wait till we see what happens in Georgia. I think um, it's going to be easier for him to say to the progressive wing of the party, like, what do you want me to do? Now, they'll get appointments. They'll get lots of executive orders. There's many, many things he can do to, to, to make them happy, but he cannot pass legislation. And, you know, that's the, the question of how um, rancorous the divisions inside the Democratic Party will be um, remains to be seen. But you're already having this big debate in the House. You've got AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, saying the reason why these moderates lost is they didn't use Facebook enough. Then you have Connor Lamb, who's a moderate Democrat who won in a very blue district in Pennsylvania, saying, look, the reason moderates lost is because of uh, defund the police and um, opposition to fracking and all sorts of kind of cultural left stuff. So there's a debate going on, but right now they don't even have the opportunity to push the big structural change uh, pieces of legislation. Uh, let me just pull back the lens um, to knit what you just said together with what you were talking about a second ago around realignment. Um, you know, this, uh, by the popular vote, by the electoral vote, a solid win for the Democrats and Joe mm -hmm. Biden. And yet, in many other ways, and we'll talk about state government in a second, it was a setback for Democrats. Yes. Didn't get that wave. And, you know, to, to underscore a point that, that, that many people have made already, you know, Donald Trump, after four years in office, got more votes got in, more. 20, in 2016. Didn't get enough more, but he got more. Yeah. So what, what's... What do you conclude from that? Okay. What's the this country is, saying? Okay, um, this is this is the big, this is the question. Political operatives on both sides are spending 24 hours a day trying to figure out the answer to this question. There are all sorts of theories, and I can share with you some of them. Number one, this is unique to Donald Trump, that he was a better motivator for Republican voters than anybody else. And this time... People, Republicans who were disaffected or independents who were disaffected with Donald Trump voted for him in 2016. In 2018, the reason why there was a wave election, of course, Democrats were hoping to repeat that this time and it didn't work. But in 2018, the only way that anyone who didn't like Donald Trump could register their disapproval was to vote for a Democrat for Congress. That was the only option they had. And they did in droves. And it was historic. Democrats picked up 40 seats. OK, this time they had a choice. They could vote for Joe Biden if they didn't like Donald Trump, and then they could vote for their Republican congressman or state legislature. You know, so, the, so that was part of it. Joe Biden had no coattails. Realignments need coattails. If you're going to have, you know, the realignment that Democrats dreamed of was this coalition, and it's very, and Joe Biden did put together a very broad coalition um, of college educated white voters, uh, people of color, young people, you know just kind of ate into some of those Trump rural and exurban counties just enough. Um, and the, the Republicans were going to, Democrats hope, were going to be left as a kind of rump, white, rural, non-college educated party. That hasn't happened yet. It might still be happening over time. That's what it looked like 2018 was telling us. The, the, the Republican coalition was broken. The coalition of highly educated or higher income suburbanites and rural non-college whites evangelicals had been broken. It seems like Donald Trump put, the, put it together just a little bit this time. So one theory is it's unique to him. The other theory is it was all these, you know, cultural left issues that the majority of Americans just don't want. 
uh, even though they want a higher minimum wage and they probably would like Medicare to, uh, to start at 60. Um, the other theory is that we are a center-right country and um, voters were telling us because they sent divided government to Washington again, that, that they want both parties to work together. The thing that's amazing is voters hate gridlock, but they keep on sending divided government to Washington and that's how you get gridlock. But when I, when I say that realignments are good for America is realignment meaning there's a dominant party and a minority party, the way the Republicans in Congress were for years and years, that was like the sun and the moon. You know, the Democrats were the sun and the Republicans were the moon. And they, I'm not saying they accepted that, but but there was a there was a, there was a way that that more progress could be made. I don't know if we're going to get there, or if we're going to just stay at loggerheads, perfectly split down the middle like we are now. We'll we'll see. I want to give a shout out to Marquita Wiggins on our team who's helping us with slides and some of these clips. Marquita, I want to go to uh, the first of the two voting return slides, if you don't mind, because it speaks to what Mara was just talking about. This is a look at exit poll data from the most recent election. And you can see um, really there's, there's not substantial movement um, in many of the core constituencies that helped uh, propel uh, Trump to election in terms of his coalition in 2016. Uh, where are the notable differences as you look at um, you know the percentage points here and there in the final analysis, Mara? Which, which yeah. what did Joe Biden improve upon in this mix? Well, he improved upon he improved with white college educated people, suburban people, independents. I mean. The thing that Donald Trump did, the, the big headline was, oh my God, Donald Trump got more votes than he did last time. Yes, he got 46.1% last time, and this time he's going to end up with 47 point something. He is really good. When I talked about Joe Biden having a strategy of breadth, putting together a big coalition, Donald Trump's strategy was depth. He, look at how well he did with white non-college. He took his base voter and found more people who look just like them, but haven't turned down in 2016. So well, he just drilled down deeper. Yeah, yeah. So he, he just drilled down there. deeper and found more of them. And he was very good at that. And don't forget, Republicans had a very good get out the vote operation. They had a great data operation. They did not stop door knocking because of the pandemic. Democrats did. Democrats decided to follow the public health advice that probably hurt them. I know from talking to people in Georgia that that will not happen between now and January 5th. Pandemic or no pandemic, they're going to be out there knocking on doors. Much has been made of uh, the way women have voted um, in response to President Trump. Um, and most recently in 2020, much has been made of the that next vote. Um, help us part out. Democrats say never say that. Yes. If you talk to Latino Democrats, don't say Latinx. <laughs> it's yes, you've you've basically just um, created a monolith where there's so much diversity. Yes, and, and you and because most people don't know what it means, it sounds like some culturally elite thing to say. Have you heard Ruben Galego talk about this? He's a you know li, li, uh, Hispanic a member of Congress, Democrat, he, from Arizona. He says that is the first thing Democrats want to do better with li, with uh, Hispanic voters. Stop saying Latinx. And, and what what is, <laughs> what do he and others advise on that point? And because it speaks to something, yeah. it speaks to uh, a cultural divide, yeah. um, uh, a framing. Um, it speaks to the way um, you know uh, different communities and, yeah. and where you are on the political spectrum yeah. sort of how you. So this is the say. Latino vote. When 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 Democrats and Republicans, you know, are pouring over these results, trying to figure out what was the message here. Uh, the Latino vote is one of the biggest questions inside that riddle, which is, we know in Florida, Cubans and Venezuelans responded really, really well to Donald Trump's message about socialism because they know what socialism is. Now, socialism is not uh, you know, a public option in Obamacare, but Trump was very successful in making anything Democrats stand for sound like socialism. So that's one thing. But uh, Joe Biden didn't do well enough among Puerto Ricans either there. So that's a, that's something for people to investigate. Then you get to Texas, all along the Rio Grande Valley. That's where Hillary Clinton won some of those counties by 66%. Joe Biden won them, but by m very narrow margins. Okay, what's different there? As Latino pollsters and strategists keep on telling us over and over again, you know, the, 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 the Hispanic vote is not a monolith. 
and along the border, southern border of Texas, you've got a lot of people, they are not immigrants. They've been there for generations and generations. So they're not that concerned about DACA or immigration. They're concerned about how their small business is going to continue to stay open during the pandemic. So they were more open to the Republican message. Uh, then you go to Arizona, where Donald, where Joe Biden won. He won because of Hispanics. There, uh, the hardline anti-immigration policies of the Republican Party, which predated Donald Trump, you know, Sheriff Arpaio was kind of the, 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 the leader in that, that created a tremendous opening for Democrats and they took it. Now you talk to, you know, Hispanic activists and they say that the Democrats still never invested enough money uh, to organize, but they pulled it off anyway. So lots of complexity in that Hispanic vote, but um, definitely openings for, for Republicans. Janet asks, what happened to the white suburban women vote in this election? It went for Biden. I mean, if you had, I think you had a slide. It went for Biden. Um, that was something that um, I think, I think Donald Trump might have still, did he still win white women? Um, we can go back to that. Slide. You know what? Here's the problem with exit polls. This is in, a, in many months from now, we will get the big Pew survey and we will find that some of this stuff is wrong. Yeah. One of the things we learned in 2016, or we thought we knew, is Donald Trump white, won white women by 52%, which it actually says here, because that's what the exit poll said, 52%. And it says he won white women by 52% this time. That yeah, these are exit polls women. year over, or four yeah. years over four Yeah, years. but in fact, the Pew Voters Survey, which surveys like thousands and thousands of voters, even bigger than these, showed that he only won white women by 47% in 2016. So these are disputed. It's hard to get, you know, exact uh, information from from voters. You can go to, you can find out who won various counties, but these are people telling you who they voted for after they come out of the polls. Uh, anyway, but yes, white suburban women went for Biden. White women overall probably still went for Donald Trump by a small margin. Let me go back to uh, the slide that we had up earlier around the state legislative oh picture. Yeah. Um, so as so many of us focus on what's happening in Washington, real political observers like yourself and political yeah. take yeah. a close look at what's happening yeah. around the state. And you can see Democrats very much were hoping to yeah. pick up control of six states during this cycle. They too experienced a significant setback here. Yeah. You can see Republicans still hold an advantage um, straight up, and then they yeah. also have play in states that are categorized as split control, yeah. whether it's legislative or governor in nature. My question to you, Mara, is what are the implications for yeah. this as it relates to coalitions and party yeah. power more broadly? This is this is something that I want to do, you know, some stories on. This is really, really important. Okay. So state control, state legislatures are really important. And it's, it's even more important in an election with a zero at the end of it, which is what we just had. So in 2010, the last time we had a zero election, when there was a census, and of course, after the census, we have reapportionment and redistricting, district lines are drawn, whoever dominated state legislatures and governor's offices after that election, elections with a zero, they get to draw the lines that are favorable for their party. That's what happened in 2010. You had the huge red wave. Republicans took over state legislatures all over the place. They drew district lines for Congress, for state legislatures, and lo and behold, those lines helped them maintain their majorities for about 10 years. Now, gerrymanders tend to get lo long in the tooth as they get older. That's why you saw Democrats pick up seats, you know, as, as the 10th year anniversary neared. So Democrats were really hoping to change that Barack Obama and Eric Holder started an organization that was focused just on state legislative races, and they laid an egg. I mean, this was the big, the big kind of grassroots failure. These, these, these are the low to the ground seats, state legislative seats. So what does it mean? It's not as bad as 2010. If you look at that map, there still are a lot of split uh, splits where there's maybe a Democratic governor or one house one state house or the other is is um, Democrats. So that means that when you have the big arguments over drawing district lines, Democrats will have at least some sway. But for the most part, they will be on the losing end once again. Now, as the population gets more diverse, 
it's harder and harder to partisan gerrymander. You know, it's harder to, to put all the people of color in one district. You know, you hear these terms like, um, uh, what is it, cracking and, and packing. Yeah, cracking and packing. You wanna pack all the minority voters into one district so you could get more Republicans, uh, you know, into Congress. Those, those things get harder as the population gets more diverse. So Democrats are definitely at a disadvantage. I don't know if it's as bad as 2010. That's what I want to do some research on. And I want to report about this. I mean, one of the solutions to this, as crazy as it sounds, is that you have to have a mass movement of Democrats off the coasts. People just have to leave New York and California and move to swing states because one of the reasons that Republicans can be so um, efficient at partisan gerrymandering is because their voters are just more are more efficiently distributed. If you look, you know, you look at any map, uh, Democrats are massed inefficiently along the coasts and in these urban areas, and and Republicans are just sprinkled throughout. And because our system of government advantages real estate over people, that's what the United States Senate is. Uh, they have an advantage. So Democrats have to distribute themselves. I always say some billionaire should come up with a program where they offer a down payment on a mortgage to any young person who moves off the coasts to any other state. Um, but anyway, but it's, you know, it's definitely a disadvantage for Democrats and, and an advantage for Republicans. A lot of questions I want to get to um, that sort of sprinkle around topics, and we'll go back to some translation related questions as well. Um, one, one to come to is um, Jan on the near and north side says, what do you think it would take, in parentheses, something dramatic, uh, question mark, for Trump's base to disavow him, um, either now or going forward? It's um, really hard for me to imagine that, for Trump's base to disavow him. Um, it's, re it's really, really hard. I, we've never seen, it's just, it's super deep and tribal and, and people just, uh, there's a whole media ecosystem that reinforces their Trump supporters' beliefs. A lot of people who support Trump do it out of really good motives. They, for, they're against abortion. Trump was against abortion. Trump delivered on a conservative social issue agenda like none other. Um, but the interesting thing about, about the base, what the base of the Republican Party is, which is the same thing as Trump's base, is white non-college Americans are a shrinking portion of the electorate. There's still plenty of them in states like Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. There's something like 60% of the electorate, but every cycle they get 2% less as a percentage of the electorate. So over time, they're, they're not a growing part of the electorate. The Democrats do represent all of the sections of the population, the parts of the population that are growing. What Democrats were hoping was that demographic change would help them this year uh, get control of more legislative seats and maybe have a realignment. That hasn't happened. So the long term is still a little too long for Democrats, um, but the base of the Republican Party has some real structural problems because it's getting smaller and smaller relatively in the, in the electorate. In the meantime, as you look out four years, Pat wants to know, is there a Republican other than Trump you can name who would run for president in the next cycle? That is maybe the broader question is, you know, who beyond Trump might want to pick up the mantle of the party and or the Trump base? That okay, find? that's really, really good question. The problem for all of them, and there are a ton of them, Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, Vicki Haley, Marco, Marco Rubio, Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz. I mean, there are a lot of them, but as long as Donald Trump says he might want to run in 2024, I don't know how any of them even form an advisory committee. I mean, how can you go out and raise money? You might, you know, if you, you might piss off Donald Trump. Uh, I don't know how that works. The whole, the, the, the debate inside the Republican Party about what would Trumpism be without Trump, in other words, what's the future of the Republican Party post-Trump, that started the day he was elected in 2016. I've probably done three or four or five stories about this. So, but it can't proceed in earnest until he's really off the scene. This is the, you know, how can I miss you when you won't go away? Um, in terms of people who want, there are people who talk about Trumpism without the racism or xenophobia, whatever you want to call it. There are people who talk about who say, no, the white identity politics is what Trumpism is. You can't separate it out. 
There are people who say, well, we could be a populist, Marco Rubio has been talking about this, we can be a populist working man's party where we have a multiracial working class coalition. I mean, I don't know exactly how that works either. What Donald Trump did was he had populist rhetoric for the base, but he governed like a plutocrat. I mean, he had the tax cuts for the wealthy and corporations, and he had all the social issues and the Twitter feed and the grievances and the, the performative parts of the presidency for his base. So I don't know what happens to that as long as he's on the scene and wants to be dominant. And don't forget his metric for success is dominating the media narrative, whatever it might be. So it's going to be really hard for all those people who want to run in 2024. A couple of questions just that relate to the moment we're in right now, between now and January 20th, that I want to go and pick back up. Alicia and Belmont Cragen asks, what would actually happen if Trump doesn't want to leave the White House in January? I'm not sure exactly how that would work. <laughs> I think that um, there are a lot of Republicans who very subtly are trying to um, kind of uh, help him get to that point where he would leave. It's hard to imagine him walking out to that helicopter for the last time. Um, I don't think he'll ever actually concede. I think that he will always maintain this false narrative that he really won. I don't know how he leaves, um, but I do believe he will leave if he actually barricaded himself in his room with his phone and his Twitter feed. Like, what would happen? Would he be escorted out by the Secret Service? I mean, I don't really know. I don't think it's going to come to that. I don't, I'm, that's not the biggest problem. I think the biggest problem is that he delegitimizes the, the, an election that was certified or, or widely considered by every official in every state to be a free and fair election with Joe Biden as the winner. Scott asked a related question, and that is, um, in, in your view, is there any evidence that Trump is using either his lack of a concession or lack of transition or or whatever media manipulation that's happening right now as a bargaining chip to avoid legal or financial repercussions <laughs> add or to yeah. pave the way for legal or financial gain going forward? Well, there's no doubt he's doing it for legal and financial gain. There's no doubt because his, as I said, his brand he is how he makes a living. He monetizes his brand. His brand is about Trump is never, ever, ever loses anything. He's always successful. So there's no doubt he has to keep his brand going. And part of that is by maintaining the false narrative that he really won. Um, and he also, if he wants to start a digital media uh, outfit that competes with Fox, he needs to keep the false narrative going. If he wants to sell a lot of Trump merchandise and have people stay in his hotels, he needs to keep this going. So, so yes, for sure, he's going to leverage it for financial gain. In terms of making a deal, like, I don't really know what is the deal he'd make with Cy Vance in New York that says, I'll leave office and you won't prosecute me. I mean, I don't see that. I mean, he now, now he could definitely resign on January 18th and have Mike Pence pardon him and all the members of his family for all federal crimes. I, I'm not exactly sure if he can pardon him for prospective federal crimes, but he can do that. So that's one way he could make a bargain. He resigns and gets pardoned and gets some kind of legal immunity, but not from state uh, prosecution. The, the, all the New York state cases continue, um, and he's going to be in court for years and years. Um, so I don't think there's a kind of deal where he says, I'll leave office and no, and I won't ever get prosecuted by anyone. I mean, you know, no prosecutor, no state prosecutor would make that deal with him. Uh, let me um, let me follow up to just um, ask a, a related question, just um, about the final days of a Trump presidency with with Trump as president in the White House and all the powers of the executive. Mark asks, Mara, do you expect Trump to pursue some kind of dramatic action? We've been hearing rumblings about yeah. it today, even like an attack on Iran before the end of his presidency? That's, you know, that's the question. I don't know. I know that that is in the ether. People are discussing that. He wants to get tougher on Iran and also pull U.S. troops out of the Middle East. That's kind of a, <laughs> that's a real clashing message there. Wait a second. He wants to, to have a military action 
he's the guy who wants to get us out of foreign wars. So he's talking about pulling troops back. I think the National Security Advisor had a couple things to say about that today. They only want to have 2,500 left in Afghanistan and Iraq at, uh, in January. Um, so yes, he could do that, but um, Donald Trump doesn't want to be the guy who started a war as he was leaving office. I mean, those that's pretty risky. I don't know what kind of action he'd pursue against Iran. Uh, he is talking about other things he can do, more sanctions, tariffs, more pardons. Um, anything he does by executive order can be overturned by Joe Biden. Uh, yes, he's the commander in chief, so he could do some things that would be, you know, irrevocable. But um, it's unclear to me what he sees in his interest. And his interest is maintaining his position as the, you know, de facto kind of king and ruler of the Republican Party, where pretty much nothing happens in that party without his without his blessing. I don't know how an attack on Iran would um, would fit into that. But ironically, John Bolton, who you played, John Bolton was a big Iran hawk and Donald Trump didn't like that and thought that John Bolton wanted to go to war with everyone. And that's one of the reasons he says he fired him. I, I want to go to a few questions we have here from people watching that relate to broader structural elements of uh, our election process, our constitution and our government. Katie asks, I'm wondering if Mara can speak to the possibility of democratic reform of countermajority in institutions like the Supreme Court or the Electoral College, um, does it hinge on the results in Georgia, in your view? Well, I, I would say no, because even if you won both houses and both seats in Georgia, you'd still only have a 50-50 Senate. You're not going to get rid of the filibuster or pack the court with 50-50 Senate. You need a lot more senators for that. I mean, you think Joe Manchin, he's already actually said he won't vote for that. You think that John Hickenlooper, or I'm, well, actually, I'm trying to think, not John Hickenlooper, Mark Kelly, I'm trying to think of Democratic senators from swing states. You're not going to be on board for those kind of big structural changes. So the way that Democrats can make the structural changes to push back against the minoritarian, whatever we're calling them, institutions like the Senate, where fit right now, or well, before the election, 53 Republican senators represented something like 45% of America. Uh, and if you just extrapolate to 2040 with the same demographic changes, we're going to have 30% of Americans being represented by 70 senators and 70% of America being represented by 30 senators. You don't like minority rule, just wait till we get there. The only way Democrats will change that is by winning big majorities in those same institutions. Now, they can neuter the Electoral College by passing the popular vote compact in more states. I think we've already passed it in states that equal about 193 electoral votes, I think. Um, the interesting thing about the Electoral College is the Electoral College may cease to be a thorn in the side of Democrats very soon because Democrats might start winning the Electoral College. The Electoral College is only a problem if it goes against the popular vote. It certainly didn't this time. If Democrats can win Georgia and Arizona, and the blue wall states and become competitive over time in Texas, I mean, nobody's gonna be talking about the electoral college anymore because it won't matter. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I've had It'll a couple- It'll go back into it, the box where it stayed for all those hundreds of years, but anyway. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just as a quick aside, you'll appreciate this. Uh, I've had a couple of conversations and interviews recently with William Howell, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. And he's he, among others, is advocating for structural reforms to uh, government, um, but he points out as it relates to the Electoral College, he says, you know, our constitution has been widely studied, widely copied, you know, by countries all over the world uh, for centuries. The one thing that no other country <laughs> has adopted is the Electoral College. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Electoral College is just cuckoo. But, um, but, but as long as the popular vote does not diverge from the Electoral College, we're fine with the Electoral College. It's just this artifact, this vestigial thing that never really matters. It's just that twice in the last 20 years, it mattered in a way that I think did real damage to American democracy. You can't have the guy with the fewer number of votes become president too many times before people really do conclude there's something wrong with the system. Um, 
a couple of quick things before we we have just a few minutes left. And um, Stephen from, from Wilmet uh, put a comment in here. He says Mara has said twice now that half the country voted for Trump. Uh, I but, didn't mean that. I am uh, sorry. I apologize because that is wrong. Half the country did not vote for Trump. Forty-seven point something percent voted for Trump, and over fifty percent voted for Biden. So I take that as a yeah, and that and as he points out, that's of registered voters, and that's you know it's a good yeah yeah absolutely not yeah yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to come to is just a question about, you know, folks have asked questions about polling. Um, I think that's a long, it's a very important topic. It's a long topic that yeah. I think we don't have time for now and that there needs a lot more study and scrutiny. But, but a question that relates to the media, I think would be interesting to hear you reflect on. Mark from the West Loop says, Mara, you mentioned you met with your White House team and said, quote, get ready for real governing, end quote. What changes are you planning or expecting to the White House coverage in a new administration? How does that look different? Well, it looks, well for one thing, we're going to have more people. At NPR is going to send a couple more people to the White House because it's just going to be so much more to cover. Um, there will be an actual briefing every day. I don't know who the press secretary will be. Uh, I've always believed that um, the best thing about the briefings would be if the TV, if the on-camera part was only 20 minutes and then the rest of it was audio. Of course, that's in my personal interest. But um, but I think the grandstanding and the making the briefing into this whole kind of performative thing is just bad. So let the TV people get their hits in the first 20 minutes and then then turn off the cameras and keep briefing. So there will be a briefing. There will be actual policy. There will be executive orders that are not just press releases. There will be actual governing, and there will be a lot of it. Now, I don't know how much legislating there will do. There will be many legislative proposals. Like I said, I don't know how many of them will see the light of day in the Senate. Um, but we're going to have you know, a, an administration full of people who know how to use the levers of government. That was one thing Donald Trump either didn't couldn't figure it out or didn't want to or just saw the whole government was basically uh you know a, a swamp full of people who wanted to do him wrong and <clears throat> because he's a showman and he has this kind of very performative view of the presidency what he did every day what he tweeted what he said that was what the presidency was about that joe biden has a completely different concept he's going to try to use his government to enact the things he ran on you know, even though he doesn't have the Senate, he's going to, he says he feels he got a mandate for climate change, COVID, um, racial justice. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of the other things, but they're all they're infrastructure. And uh, he's going to try to do that. And that's going to be a whole, covering that is just going to be much more complex than what we've had in the last four years. It was the Trump show, basically. We've just covered the Trump show for four years. And now- I mean, you can argue that covering Trump was complicated in other ways for journalists, very complicated, but but not from a yes. policy- No, and also, and also and also he was totally he accessible. Talking. No, he, his psyche was accessible. Every, his, every thought, he never had an unexpressed thought. You know, they came out, you knew what he was thinking within one second of him thinking it because he said it or tweeted it. So yeah. anyway. Let's close with um, uh, a clip of President-elect Joe Biden from his victory speech uh, just uh, about 10 days ago. Um, let's close with this. It's time to put away the harsh rhetoric, lower the temperature, see each other again, listen to each other again. And to make progress, we have to stop treating our opponents as our enemies. They are not our enemies. They are Americans. They are Americans. Mara, my last question to you is um, a question just about that that underlying point about about just us as as people. Um, given how divided our country is, all of this data we've talked about through this conversation. Um, what are the prospects and what would need to change for us to start to beyond Biden, beyond Trump, yeah. beyond elected officials, yeah. for us to start to see each other as part of yeah. a greater whole? I think that that would take a lot of initiatives, a lot of things happening on a very basic level, individuals, families, communities. You know, how about consuming media that you don't agree with? 
You know, how about getting out of our silos and our echo chambers? How about restoring civics education, K through 12 and beyond? So people, how do you know if a democratic institution is being undermined if you have absolutely no idea what it's supposed to do in the first place? Um, so there are a million things and people are thinking about this, believe me. Um, but as I said before, the centrifugal forces of polarization and division are very powerful. Social media, the algorithm of social media, the entire business model of social media is to push us to extremes and to divide us. Um, you know, since we got rid of the fairness doctrine and have cable channels that are catered to one ideological group, you know, we don't share the same set of facts anymore. How can you have a civic discussion or a debate about big problems in America if you don't start with the same set of facts and then work your way to different opinions? Now we start with different opinions and cherry pick some facts and some of them aren't even facts at all. So the forces that have brought us to this point predated Trump. He just harnessed them and, and kind of exacerbated them. But um, they're big and I think the way to push against this is Barack Obama once said something like this, uh, something like, are you tired of having, of arguing with somebody on the internet that you don't agree with? Try having a conversation with them in person. Maybe that would be better. Um, you know, and as long as people don't forget, one of the reasons that Democrats are having such trouble in legislative races, as I talked earlier about how they're too inefficiently clumped together on the coasts, it's also a phenomenon all over the country. It's called the big sort. We live near people who think like us, consume media like us, worship like us. You know, um, we've sorted ourselves out into homogeneous communities and we'd ha we have to change that. And my only so solution is to get generations of young people to move out of their, <laughs> out of their coastal uh, enclaves and, and distribute themselves around the country. But uh, it's gonna take a lot of work. And, but you know what? We have a president who wants to do that and we'll see if he can, he can make any progress. Mara, that's a fitting note to end on. I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight for your great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to even more of your excellent questions, but uh, we encourage you to provide feedback via the survey in the comments section tonight. Also, by the way, we encourage you to mark on your calendars November 30th, where we will have another WBEZ event. This one tied to our Citizens Agenda campaign, actually building in many respects on the kind of themes that you were just talking about, Mara, where we are listening and engaging and convening community conversations as it relates to election and policy and government. Uh, we're having a town hall in Rogers Park on November 30th. You can find out more inform information about that at wbez.org slash events. Uh, also check out our coverage at WBEZ elections. Um, you can find it at wbez.org slash elections, including an analysis of what a Biden presidency could mean for Chicago and Illinois. Um, but it's been a long day for you, Mara, after many, many long months. Thank you for creating time for us to go deeper. And thanks for all the work you do day in and day out. We so appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank